I looked down the track and saw my buddy from Poland running behind as fast as he could go. Hey, look, I shouted. Wiz from Poland made it too. Wiz burst into an Olympic sprint. Come on, come on, we shouted as he rushed along the track. I've got him, I yelled, and several of us pulled him aboard. We sat on the floor, winded, and watched our homeland flash by. We were a bunch of baby-faced teenagers, trained and supposedly battle-ready, typical soldiers. From that time on, we never knew where we were going, where we were when we got there, or how long we would stay. My family's favourite holiday, Christmas, was coming up, and I didn't know how I would spend it. I already missed my family. The long train ride took us via central Germany, Bavaria and Tyrol, former Austria, now the Ostmark, and through the Brenner Pass, the border between Germany and Italy. We left the doors open during the day to watch the scenery rolling by. We couldn't wait to see Italy, our glorious fascist ally, even though we shivered and our stomachs rumbled most of the time. Provisions on the trip were cold rations and an occasional cup of hot coffee served by Red Cross workers in the cities. Cold rations were canned bread with cheese or meat for making a sandwich. We looked forward to the great steaming cauldrons of meat and vegetable stews that were served to the military in some of the railroad stations. We never knew how long we would sit in a station, because replacement troop transports were secondary to other military needs supply trains going south and trains with wounded going north. When we got to Rome, my adventurous spirit emerged. From my perch on the train, I could see St. Peter's Dome over the rooftops. Now there was something to be explored, and here I was, stuck on the train. As we were leaving, our sergeant gave us transport numbers in case the train suddenly started up and left us behind. Should that happen, our orders were to board any southbound Italian train. It didn't take me long to realise that I could use the transport numbers as excursion tickets. When we stopped in Naples one night, my reckless spirit emerged. Before me, a fabulous city stretched out invisibly, like a hidden treasure. Come on, guys, I said, trying to coax Marcus and Dieter. Let's go see this place. We've got the lyre. Italian lyre were doled out when we entered Italy. When I explained that this would be the only place we could spend the money burning in our pockets, the two agreed to the adventure. We didn't speak the language or know the town, which was in total blackout. I knew it would be difficult to find our way around. Fortunately, we had all developed cat's eyes from years of blackouts in Germany. Blackouts were customary in all warring countries due to air attacks. A little too cocky, I went too fast for my own good. I tripped over objects and fell down several times while my buddies laughed at me. Do you really know where you're going, antenna ears? Dieter jeered. Then I heard the clink of glasses and the unmistakable scent of wine and peanuts and spotted an outdoor tavern. See, I knew I'd find something, I said as I peered through the darkness for a place to sit. Yeah, antenna ears, you did it, Dieter had to admit. He eased himself onto a bar stool. In the light of a small candle, I could see the Italians, our allies, give us friendly nods. For the first time in weeks, we felt free and relaxed, eating peanuts and drinking Chianti wine. We had hoped to see some girls, but in those days, proper young ladies were not allowed to socialise in such places. After many hours of Gemütlichkeit with the Italians, we gave in to our habit of duty and stumbled back to our train, still standing in the station. We smirked over our little adventure and the fact that we hadn't gotten caught. The train started up soon enough, taking us the rest of the way to Reggio de Calabria at the boot of Italy. When we jumped off the train, we herded into what looked like a POW camp surrounded by a high wire fence. What's going on? I muttered. My buddies and I tried to find someone in charge. These are your temporary quarters on the way to Africa, our sergeant explained. They're under tight security. What's the reason for this? I asked. You'll see. We saw why that night. Our camp was sleepy by day and a beehive of activity in the evening when the Italians came with wine and money to barter or to pay for parts of our uniforms. Our tropical uniform consisted of khaki green cotton garments, 
two pairs of long trousers, one of which was a pair of jodhpurs, riding pants and a pair of shorts, three long-sleeved shirts, underwear and socks. Our tropical footwear was made of canvas and leather, knee-high laced boots to wear with our jodhpurs and a pair of ankle-high boots. We also had woolen items for chilly desert nights, a sweater, an overcoat and wool gloves. Each of us wore webbed canvas belts with a brotbeutel, a carrier to hold a day's supply of rations. A sidearm, two water bottles, a steel helmet, a pith helmet, a visored cap and a K-98 carbine were also part of the outfit. Our total gear included a rucksack with a blanket and a special poncho, which could be snapped into a tent with the ponchos of four other men. A gas mask, sun and dust goggles, a dust scarf and a mess kit completed the outfit. Fully outfitted with this gear, we looked like rich tourists. The typical Italian soldier had only one uniform, made of wool and usually missing buttons. Some soldiers didn't even have bootlaces. They haggled through the fence every night for our gear, unsuccessfully. The Italians didn't realise that we needed everything we had. We didn't know if we could ever get resupplied, and besides, we were held accountable for our uniforms and equipment. A week or so later, trucks took us to an airfield where Ju-52 Junker transport planes waited for our flight to Tunis, North Africa. The German Air Force never had air superiority in this theatre of war, since we depended on our Italian allies for air and naval support. Our sergeant shouted for attention. He was the first of many that I had during my stint in the Africa Corps. Enlisted men like me were shuffled around from place to place, and from sergeant to sergeant like cards in a poker game. This NCO had the responsibility of getting us to the airfield in Tunis in one piece. Planes and gliders will join us from Sicily. Get ready for the ride of your life, he shouted. German junkers revved up their motors. Inside, fifty of us huddled on the floor with our gear. For most of us, this was our first flight. My stomach was doing flip-flops, I heard huge propellers growl as they lifted their loads off the ground, then settle into a whine as they flew low over the Mediterranean. Manned machine guns thrust out of windows protected our convoy. The sergeant said, Listen up, we expect attacks by British planes from Malta at the airport at Tunis. When we land, grab your gear and exit the runway as fast as you can go, and I mean quick, got it? We came in bumping hard on an airfield full of craters that had been hastily filled in. I grabbed my gear, said a prayer, and jumped. Just as predicted, British Spitfires shot at us as we ducked off the runway toward cover. Our planes took off as soon as the last man flung himself out. No one got hit, but our hearts were pounding triple time. Man, I didn't think we'd get shot at the second we got here, Dieter said. Well, we're in Africa, and we're in the cause, so I guess we can expect more of the same from now on, I said. That gem of wisdom must have come from my father. Trucks waited outside the airfield to take us to Kairouan, Tunisia, the fourth holiest city of Islam. This was a place I had heard about. The low, flat-roofed buildings matched the colour of the earth. A brilliant blue sky cast deep shadows. Africa was a far different world than mine in every respect. The first natives I encountered looked completely different from the average German burger. Bright red fezes covered the heads of many Muslim men. Black cloth draped the women from the tops of their heads to their toes. They carried market baskets as they walked behind their men. Why are they so covered up and quiet? I wondered. They were quite a contrast to our women who had taken male occupations when our able-bodied men had been sent off to war. The most noticeable women on German streets were our bossy female streetcar conductors. In this exotic setting and culture, we youngsters were readied for battle. At Kairouan, we stayed in a camp of tents. At least the tents weren't enclosed in barbed wire. After our officers organised us into military units for action, we were given a lot of leisure time. In the event that we might mingle with the local population, we were given instructions on how to behave with Muslims. Tunisia was still a reluctant French colony and friendly to Germans. The natives treated us with respect and considered us their liberators from France. 
We were told that if we went to a Muslim home, we must knock and immediately turn our backs, since an unveiled woman might answer the door, and that we must remove our shoes if invited inside a home or a mosque. I hoped to be invited to a Tunisian home to try out my new knowledge. Marcus and Dieter, on the other hand, quickly got bored with the city. But I liked to find my way around in foreign cities, figure out the exchange rate and try to speak the language. My entertainment was going to the Kasbah, heady with strange sounds, smells and flavours. Spices, olives, grapes and citrus fruits were grown in the area and haggled over at this market. I craved oranges and soon befriended an orange seller, a few years older than I, named Amir. While we did not share a language, I used my sheet with Arabic words to communicate with him. One day he invited me to dinner in his home. His little house was typical, built of mud bricks and whitewashed. I pointed to my boots. Do I have to take them off? I asked. Amir wagged his finger in a no sign. The aromas coming from a corner of a room that was the kitchen made my mouth water. We sat on oriental carpets and ate from a low table set with platters of couscous, pita, vegetables, and a jug of hot sauce for dipping. I watched him eat without silverware, using only his right hand before I followed suit. We sipped strong Arabian coffee. As I expected, his wife did not eat with us. While we were dining, I asked if he could show me his mosque, which dominated the walled city. He agreed to take me when there was no religious service. Since my arrival, I had heard the call of the muezzins from the nearby mosque calling their faithful to prayer five times a day. I saw men stop what they were doing to get out their prayer rugs and kneel before God. I was curious to see the inside of the famous mosque. What was different? Would the answer to what made them act so religious be inside, I wondered? Although Christian, a baptised and confirmed Lutheran, I did not feel as closely connected to my church as I had as a child. Religious observations were discouraged under Hitler's rule. My parents told me they felt torn and confused about the absence of religion in their lives. I knew little of the other two major religions, Judaism and Islam. Now here was something to write home about. After dinner, Amir and I approached the enormous mosque. It rose high above the flat-roofed mud houses. A tower on its roof overlooked the city. Do I have to take my boots off? I asked Amir once again, pointing to my feet. He clicked his tongue several times in admonishment that I would have to even ask. He motioned me to take them off. Leaving my irreplaceable boots outside was a leap of faith. I tried to keep an eye on them while I marvelled over the interior of the mosque, vastly different from my home church in Kiel, Germany. Open to the outdoors, the mosque's most remarkable features were its brightness and its columns arranged in rows in an interior devoid of benches and chairs. Amir pointed to the wall ahead of us and said, Mecca. I understood that the wall we stood before faced Mecca. The enormous room was divided by a grill into male and female sections and decorated with brightly painted mosaic tiles. Amir gave me a privileged glimpse into Islam. I had forgotten about my boots. I hurried back outside. My boots must have attracted attention, but they were still there. Since I had shown so much interest in his mosque, Amir tried to tell me about the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. After many attempts at words and pantomimes, I grasped the concept of the Hagira, understanding that it was the Prophet's forced journey from Mecca to a more congenial place. I wished that I had the words to describe my Lutheran church at home to this Muslim. Despite the social reaction to religion as a whole and my family's confusion, I had always been comforted by my personal faith. It gave me words to cling to as war swirled about me. Little did I know that I would soon be on my own Hegira, my own forced journey. The next day, Marcus and Dieter and I shook hands as we parted company. I was assigned to an anti-tank unit that moved to a military front somewhere around Spetla or Kasserina. Many fronts dotted the long, jagged attack and defence line. I was curious to see what a front actually looked like. I didn't know whether I felt relieved or disappointed when all I saw was more of the same desert.
Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's placement of my unit was a small part of a complicated plan to drive the Alliers out of Tunisia. Rommel had withdrawn 1,400 miles across Egypt and Libya to arrive in Tunisia at the Marith Line in January 1943. In February, he linked up with Kolgen Jürgen von Arnim of the 5th Panzer Army, which Hitler had rushed to Tunisia after America's Operation Torch landings. The armour is the core of the motorised army, Rommel declared. Everything turns on it. Certainly the Desert Fox based his entire campaign on this premise. The desert itself, with its flat, open terrain, provided the setting for armoured warfare in a classic form. The result was a technology race to see which nation could equip its armies with tanks that would outshoot, outmaneuver, and outlast their foes. The tanks ranged from speedy light models for reconnaissance to heavily armoured types for assaults on fortified positions. The Americans had Sherman tanks, which could reach speeds of 25 miles an hour, and had 75 millimeter guns in a power driven turret. They also had Grant tanks, which were bigger and had 37 mm and 75 mm guns, but a design flaw hampered the larger weapon. We had Panzers. The Panzer III was speedy and manoeuvrable and carried a 50 mm a gun. Panzer IVs, Tiger tanks, took on machine gun nests, tanks, infantry, and anti tank guns with a 75 mm turret gun. By the time I got to Africa, we had the latest models outfitted with thicker armour and with longer-barrelled, more powerful guns than before. Assembled at the front, I, along with the other enlisted men, waited for instructions. Get out your shovels, boys, our sergeant said with a grin, and make yourselves at home. We divided into four-man teams and burrowed into the flat plain to protect ourselves from bullets and from the weather. We had with us our 50 mm and 75 mm anti-tank guns, which we towed behind open, all-terrain, tan-painted, half-truck, half-tank vehicles. We made ourselves as comfortable as possible in our dugouts. A little ingenuity was called for. Waterproof gas mask canisters were just the thing to protect our cigarettes from getting wet. We grumbled that the officers had overburdened us with too much stuff to carry, we pitched out the pith helmets that gave us no protection from bullets or cold, but we were glad for our wool sweaters and gloves and our greatcoats. The temperature dropped as much as 60 degrees at night. We expected to see action, yet we neither saw nor heard signs of battle. They told us that the action was taking place in the north. Even so, danger was a constant companion on the front. The ground was littered with explosive mines, Tribes of desert nomads, called Bedouins, often appeared as they followed their long-established trading routes. Turbaned men, wrapped in robes and wearing leather boots, rode camels with colourfully woven saddle blankets. The Bedouins' women walked ahead to scout for mines. Women were obviously more expendable than camels in the minds of the Bedouins. Are they wives or slaves? I wondered. Watching the nomads pass by was a welcome diversion. Nearly two weeks passed as we camped out at this post alongside an Italian unit. Scruffy and as ill-clad as the soldiers we had seen in Italy, the Italians were different from us in other ways. Much more fun-loving than we Germans, they gathered together, drank wine and sang on duty at night, probably hoping that British patrols would hear them and stay away. Our Italian comrades were not keen on standing watch alone. My buddies and I weren't keen on standing guard alone either. However, since we were known as highly disciplined Germans, we stoically went off solo to our watches in the dark desert. We hoped just as fervently that a Brit with a sharp knife wouldn't sneak up on us. The Italian soldiers had a wine ration doled out a litre a day per man, but it was tainted with the smell of the old gas canisters it was stored in. The Italians got hot pasta meals each day with their wine. We were given bread or dry toast, called zwieback, which was mouldy sometimes, and sausage or sardines in olive oil. Occasionally we were given a treat, a new chocolate bar laced with cola called Coca-Cola. As a beverage we received clear water from jerry cans painted with white crosses to distinguish them from gas cans. A supposedly sanitary water supply came from wells that Germans had dug in the area. 
Still, men stationed in Africa for long periods became jaundiced and had sores that wouldn't heal. Some of our leaders thought the jaundice was caused by the lack of fresh fruit and vegetables. Rommel himself tried to prove that our diet was sufficient by only eating what we did. Within two years, army rations in Africa made him chronically ill. Nevertheless, we considered our food somewhat superior to the Italians' fare. The Italians seemed to feel the same way. They gave us sympathetic looks as they chowed down. Their cans of food were printed with the letters AM. My buddies and I thought that the labelling was hilarious. At every meal, some joker would announce, they're eating Ultraman, Canada Old Man, again, and we'd laugh our heads off. Luckily, our Italian comrades didn't understand German, or we probably would have had some fistfights. In February, the rains came. The German command was caught unprepared. The cold seasonal rains transformed the desert into a sea of mud that had a brutal force of its own. Trucks and transports stopped in their tracks. Motorcycles got mired. Thick ooze nearly sucked the boots off our feet. How are we supposed to live in this muck? I asked my sergeant. It could be worse, he said. Neither side wants to risk a battle stuck in the mud. Think of this as a vacation. About all our commander could manage with such conditions was to secure chains for tyres and treads to keep from getting stuck in our own encampment. We lived, ate and slept in cold goo. Wet slime was our bedfellow. The ponchos we unsnapped into four-man tents were as muddy as our trenches. We had no way to keep clean and dry. By mid-February 1943, Field Marshal Rommel pulled my unit back from the front to become part of a preparation for a German offensive in northern Tunisia. As our armoured caravan moved toward the Atlas Mountains, the landscape changed. I got excited by the sight of colourful scenery, so different from my home on the Baltic Sea. There I was, used to blue-grey waves, black and white seagulls, and weathered wooden piers. Here we passed rugged ranges of red rocks, winding rivers, cork forests, olive groves, vineyards, and rustic farms. But on one short break, I overheard our sergeant pointing out the disadvantages of the landscape I admired. See those narrow mountain gorges. Our tanks might have to squeeze through them. Look at those hillsides covered with all that shrubbery. The enemy can conceal mortars there. Take a good look at the height of those hills. The enemy could be up there watching us right now, Sergeant said as he squinted up at a ridge. A cold chill settled along my spine as I tried to spot British scouts above us. Years later, I read that we were on our way to take part in one of Rommel's elaborate schemes to defeat the British. Our regiment, the 47th Panzer Grenadiers, became a part of Battlegruppe Booz, led by Lieutenant Colonel Booz, our commander. We were reserves against the British, who had gathered strength by pulling in their forces Bicet in Libya. We got a taste of British fighting methods at our first skirmish. The British led their troops into the fight with the eerie whine of Scottish bagpipes, while our tough sergeant spurred us on. The ominous wheeze of the bagpipes sent jolts of adrenaline up my spine. Man, I wish I could shut them up, I shouted over the din. I wish I could help you do it, the sergeant said. My buddies winced and looked grim. Poised for battle, we were as ready as teenage boys could possibly be. Our unit had been assigned anti-tank action. It took smooth teamwork to hold the ammunition, to load and to aim the anti-tank guns. Our inexperienced group of youngsters was always placed on the fringes of battles and skirmishes. We knew we had a lot to learn. I hoped we would live long enough to learn it. We did what was expected of us and listened for orders. During this skirmish and the next ones we got a taste of the battles yet to come. We were placed so far back from the fray that we saw very little of what went on. But we heard the shooting and could tell that our guys had held their own. When we weren't on the front, we slept in tents and sometimes in abandoned farmhouses. Then we could clean the mud off our equipment and ourselves. Once clean, I could write letters to my family. Our mail, which included a German army newspaper called Die Oase, the Oasis, and an occasional meal of meat stew, was delivered to a field kitchen about ten miles behind our lines. 
one of our all-terrain vehicle drivers had to wait until dark before he could drive back to the field kitchen to retrieve the food and precious mail. At night, British shelling was sporadic, in contrast to daytime, when they shelled continuously. One night, I was told to accompany an all-terrain vehicle driver named Max to pick up our food and mail. Visions of a yummy stew of beef, peas and potatoes danced in my head. Max glared out into the sparkling clear night and was not pleased. This is a not a good night for a pickup. Why? I asked. I couldn't see any reason to be spooked. Even the moon seemed to cooperate by being as small as possible. It's too quiet, Max said. It's easier to make the field kitchen when we have a storm. I thought that storms always made driving more risky, I said. Not in this case, Max said. You'll see what I mean. The desert was so quiet that our vehicle, made even noisier with chains on its treads, attracted British gunners before we had gone a mile. The British pinpointed us by sound alone. Shells exploded around us. Max stopped for a minute. What to do? Keep going. Turn around. As soon as he stepped on the gas, a shell exploded right where we had halted. God is watching us, I thought. I braced myself in my seat as Max sped full throttle to the field kitchen. We stopped only long enough to pick up individual cans of stew fastened together by threes, as well as a waterproof bag of mail. On the trip back, British gunners homed in on us again. Shells flew thick and fast. Max slammed on the brakes. Grab the food, get out, Max shouted. Yeah, yeah, I got it, I yelled. Max and I grabbed the mail and as many cans as we could before throwing ourselves into a crater made by artillery shells. The mouth-watering aroma of beef gravy wafted around us as we lay in the mud with shells whistling over our heads. When can we go back? I shouted. When I say so, Max yelled. We stayed put until Max thought it was safe to return and to start up the vehicle. Max had exceptional night vision. He followed a trail I couldn't see and located black ditches in the dark. Twice more, Max braked to a stop near deep holes and helped me grab all the food before we hurled ourselves with the cans into the ooze. By the time we got back and delivered the mail and the food, I wasn't hungry anymore. Our little trip into the desert was one diversion I could have done without. Once a week, another kind of diversion dropped from the sky. The Africa Post was delivered via a high-altitude drop from an Allied plane. An American-generated newspaper written in German highlighted German failures on all fronts. The Post cited unsettling statistics. Three German soldiers have died every minute of the day since June 1941. A February issue proposed a plan of surrender. Come alone or bring other comrades. Bring your greatcoat, mess kit and shaving kit. Leave your weapon and bring, if possible, this newspaper, which will assure free passage through English, American and French lines. My buddies and I liked the cartoons, but we didn't know if anything in the Africa Post was true. Their plan for us to surrender looked like their way of getting a better shot at us. From time to time, Allied planes dropped surrender leaflets on us. Colonel General von Arnim tells you, before us, the enemy, behind us the sea, there is no way back. Your mind tells you differently. Behind the enemy, the detention camp. Behind the detention camp, the prisoner of war camp in England or America. Behind the prisoner of war camp, home, there is a way back. The dead do not go home. But the prisoner who remains alive will see home again. I kept my confusion to myself and soldiered on. Toward the end of that filthy February, my unit was attached to Corps Gruppe Weber for an attack on British and US forces at Spitler. Both sides had been waiting for the end of the rainy season. Many years later, I learned that by March 15th, Germany's Kolgen Friedrich Weber had only six operational tanks remaining under his command. I also learned that in a joint strategy, the Americans and the British had combined their soldiers and war materials for their offensive. A large force of American soldiers and supplies from Algeria arrived to join the British. 
At Spitler, the earth beneath us shook as Allied tanks fired their mighty charges. Above the battlefield, a canopy of screeching Stuka planes dive-bombed the Allies. Incoming mortars crashed amid clumps of wildflowers, white daisies and bright red poppies. Soon the blood of German men flowed red as the poppies when Allied shells hit their targets. Smoke, fire and the smell of explosives and scorched earth assailed our nostrils. Temporarily deafened, I looked with dismay over the plain of exploding half-tracks and guns. A description of the biblical apocalypse I had read in childhood came to me. A hurricane of steel and fire stung my eyes and hurt my ears. I expected to be blasted to smithereens any minute, yet I didn't even know the object of the battle going on around me. My buddies and I looked at each other in wonder when we heard the next order. Cease firing. God is with me, I thought. The Allied fusillade had missed us. Our team sat down on the ground and shakily lit cigarettes. All around us, bleeding and dying men and boys murmured prayers or called for their mothers while medics did all they could. Man, that was terrible, I shouted, voicing the understatement of the year. But there were no words that I knew to describe what we had just been through. So many dead, so many dead, so many hurt, I mumbled. My head pounded and my ears rang. My team just shook their heads. Yah! Looking back more than fifty years later, all I can say is, what a tragic waste of life. What an immeasurable loss of good men, for their families, who still sadly recall husbands, fathers and brothers who never came home. How could Hitler and his advisers have considered them expendable? What motivated Hitler and his high-ranking advisers to keep seeking more power and more glory for themselves, without giving a second thought to the boys and men they sent off to war? They didn't even know if they could keep us supplied. Later, I would confront larger issues concerning Hitler's actions. How could they disregard all the homeless, hungry women, children and refugees? How did they think they could ever repair the infrastructure and all the devastated cities of Germany? Back then, my anti-tank team had barely enough time to gather our wits and our weapons when our sergeant said, Pick up your gear. This regiment is moving out. We're providing field support. I figured out later that we were part of an offensive by General von Arnim that covered the area between El Alla and Fonduk. On our trek through the wooded hills toward the mountains, newly leafed out trees provided some cover. The ground finally provided traction. We could, mercifully, set up our ponchos on some dry dirt. We had little respite before our next big fight, the Battle of Kasserine Pass. This pass was one of the few large corridors through the mountains. Although I didn't know it at the time, the battle was crucial to the enemy because the pass led to Algeria and the town of Tabessa, a vital allied communications and supply base. Another road led to the city of Thala, with tanks and planes, Germany's Rommel pursued American troops across Tunisia to the western dorsal of the Atlas Mountains. On February 19, 1943, the Americans had to make a stand in the basin of Kasserine Pass in order to defend Tebessa. We funneled through five narrow passes into the basin, accompanied by shrieking Stukas. This was the first time that Axis forces faced the Americans in a major battle in Africa. Our sergeant had complete faith in Brig Gen Karl Buellowius, who launched a major artillery barrage. The sergeant scoffed at the lightweight American M3 tanks he tracked through his binoculars. Their toys compared to our panzers. They're flimsy, he said. A panzer can destroy an M3 in just one shot. That wasn't all. Buellowius unleashed the new weapon, the Nebelwerfer. These six-barreled rocket launchers were said to shower the enemy with fatal missiles. Yet while I heard the whoosh of our rockets screaming toward the enemy, I saw our vehicles being hit by returned fire, saw more of our boys dead and dying. By 4.30 that afternoon, the rest of our troops poured into the basin through Kasserine Pass. I expected to be blasted to kingdom come as we loaded, aimed and shot our anti-tank guns, until we heard those welcome words, cease firing. At the end of the battle, my buddies and I lit cigarettes, trying to calm our nerves and waited for our ears to stop ringing. 
One of my buddies congratulated me with typical German sarcasm. Well, I see you live to fight for another day. Yeah, I blurted out. I like to be out of fearing Rangje whenever I can. I thank God that Alid fire missed me time and time again. I'm grateful that I was never seriously wounded and was able to recover emotionally from the sickening battles. Unlike many of my peers, I lived on to get married and to raise sons and daughters. Looking back on these bloody battles, I'm glad that none of my children had to be in combat, even though three of our boys were in the American Armed Forces. As for the Battle of Kasserine Pass, my last major battle, I read later that the Germans won this conflict but bungled the rest, due to the dual command at this point by General Rommel and General von Arnim. Both of them answered to Marshal Albert Kesselring in Rome, and both messaged him about their plans. General Rommel wanted to exploit German gains by striking Tebessa. Von Arnim did not. Kesselring ended up siding with Rommel, but by then precious time had been lost. During the two days the commanders bickered, the Allies gathered enough strength to repel Rommel. While the generals argued, von Arnim shifted our troops, intending to strike farther north. Rommel took time out to examine captured US war material, tanks, trucks, troop carriers and weapons. The abundance of supplies and the profusion of spare parts amazed him. By contrast, his forces were down to one day's ammunition and only six days' food. His vehicles had just enough gasoline to travel 120 miles. Three days after the battle, Rommel flew to Germany to try to persuade Hitler to abandon North Africa entirely and thereby save the Africa Corps from annihilation. Predictably, Hitler refused to listen to his argument and forbade the Desert Fox to return to Tunisia. Africa will be held, the Führer snapped, and you must go on sick leave. Hitler gave command of both armies to Colonel General von Arnim. As enlisted men, we knew very little about all this. When the next issue of our German army newspaper, the Oasis, reached us, we read that Rommel had fallen ill and von Arnim had replaced him. Move out, shouted my sergeant. We followed his lead back in the direction we originally came, to a defensive position west of Kairouan. In April, an enormous force of American tanks attacked us in two skirmishes with ferocious hails of artillery. Shells flew, mortars burst, and bullets shot everywhere at once. This time, our unit was not as lucky. We couldn't move our half-tracks had run out of fuel. Through bursts and bangs, I saw our anti-tank guns and half-tracks explode, saw our men lying dead or injured. We kept firing until we heard the order, retreat. Those of us left standing abandoned our anti-tank guns and followed our sergeant into the hills. The beauty of spring in full bloom was lost on me. I felt dazed, shocked and exhausted. The guys around me looked the same way. The loss of our vehicles turned us into foot soldiers, the infantry. With barely enough time to catch a breath, we marched off to an offensive that I later discovered to be Mejez El Bab. My unit was still attached to Gruppe Weber. The entire group included Panzer Gruppe Lang, with 77 tanks, 14 of them Tigers. Weber had three other groups, Gruppe Eder, Gruppe Audorf and Gruppe Schmidt, with a battalion of Panzers. Other regiments joined us, Göring's parachute unit, a mountain regiment, and the reserve group that included the two battalions of our regiment. The entire operation made a spoiling attack on the Mejez El Bab area. My unit attempted to take another hill, called Grenadier Hill, and seemed to be succeeding, but we heard an order. Halt the attack. At that point, we marched up Longstop Hill, a location our side had held for four months. Longstop Hill, known to the natives as Jebel Amera, was about two miles long and about 690 metres high. Although it wasn't immediately apparent, Longstop had twin peaks of about the same height. This was an advantage for our side. Whoever held Longstop Hill commanded the valley all the way to Tunis, about 25 miles away. The next day, the Allies, preceded by whaling bagpipes, attempted to seize Longstop Hill. They attacked us over and over for the next four days. 
On the third night, our beleaguered officers broke out what was left of their brandy and gave it to their troops to revive them. Drink up, our sergeant said. It will make you feel better. It may have relaxed my sore muscles, but the next morning I felt groggy and off balance. The battle resumed. In the midst of the furor, I was hit in the back and knocked flat on my face. I thought I had been pierced through with bullets. I was amazed when I peeked at my chest and didn't see any blood. Klaus, my teammate, checked me over. How bad are you hit? There's some blood on your back. I guess I'm okay, I said. He pulled me to my feet and examined me more closely. Good God, he said. It looks like you've been hit by our own shrapnel, but I'm alive, I thought. God is truly good. We didn't have time for Klaus to pick out the shrapnel, so he smeared my wounds with the sulphur cream we had been slathering on cactus punctures and scorpion bites. Then he taped on some bandages. Bagpipers tooted weird hoots and howls as they dogged us. Their savage shrieks sounded as if they were almost at our feet. Blasts of ammunition annihilated more of our men. Attack followed attack. Our response weakened. Even a private could see that we had run out of ammunition. New orders were shouted. Retreat! We scrambled to the rear and reassembled at the foot of the Atlas Mountains. We got our next order on a hill, dig in. Dirt flew thick and fast as soldiers dug as deep as possible for the next onslaught. Klaus and I dug madly, deeper and deeper, throwing dirt by the shovel full in every direction. We felt the Allies breathe down our necks. Finally satisfied with our work and hunkered down, we heard the unmistakable squeaks and rumbles of tanks grow louder as they bore down on us. Like young foxes in their dens, we tried to blend in with the desert until the sounds of war died away.